Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You are all welcome to this webinar. Social and behavior change communication in the disinformation age, a Nigerian webinar. I'm sure we are all aware of the history of social and behavior change communication, especially the conference. I'm sure we are aware of situation across the world uh, from the year 2020 up till now, the postponement of the conference, and the fact that the conference at the global level is going to take place between December 5 to December 9 in Marrakesh, Morocco. That is the International SBCC Summit 2022. And a number of webinars have been uh, implemented. Uh, I know of uh, South Africa, which implemented just a few uh, days ago. Uh, this is a term for Nigeria. And as we go along, we would uh, paste uh, some of the links to the forthcoming webinars that will be conducted in the next couple of weeks and uh, um, days. Uh, today, we have four panelists. Today, we have four panelists who are going to lead us you know, in key areas of social and behavior change communication. There are different topics. There are different perspectives. There are different expertise. But well, the key thing is, what we are bringing today has to do with expertise in various fields. Expertise in social and behavior change communication. Expertise in material development. Expertise in health education. Expertise in policy implementation and policy making. And expertise in program implementation. And today we also have, we have two moderators. Uh, I'm introducing the webinar and my colleague, Dr. Bright Oji, uh, is going to uh, you know, co-moderate with me. Uh, I'm going to introduce the first two presenters you know, to us. And then subsequently, Dr. Oji will introduce the last two presenters. And after that, we have a question and answer. Uh, but for us to have a smooth running, uh, I implore us to mute our microphone. I will implore us also not to use our uh, video uh, facility so that the bandwidth can, you know, uh, be, can enable us, you know, to hear ourselves and have a smooth uh, running. The first speaker, who is going to lead us with the topic, SBCC in the disinformation age, implications for theory, research, and practice. We all know that between year 2019 and now, the world has been gripped by COVID-19. And we know that this is not going to be the end of it. There are more. SBCC has a key role to play. That is why we feel we need to address this at the local level before the conference in Morocco. And to lead the discussion this evening uh, is Professor Adebayo Fayoin. Uh, is a strategic communications, advocacy, and behavior change expert. Is a visiting professor of mass communication at Caleb University in Lagos, Nigeria, and also an associate professor of social and behavior change communication at Witt School of Public Health in Johannesburg, South Africa. He has extensive work experience with USAID, UNICEF, and UNFPA in the area of SBCC at national and international levels. And like I said before, uh, Professor Fayoin is going to lead us with the topic SBCC in a disinformation age, implications for theory, 
research her practice. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor Adebayo Fayola. You're welcome, sir. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can see my micro, uh, my slide now. Okay. I can. Um, okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, I can. So, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, the theme of my conversation is SBCCs in an information age by implications for theory and practice. Uh, as uh, the moderator said, uh, it is situated within the context of the SBCC summit, which is taking place in Morocco in uh, Marrakesh, uh, the dead. Objectives of the summit uh, as follows. Uh, one, to identify strategies uh, that will help us in the inclusion and enhancing the inclusion and voice and participation of people, uh, to create a platform for debate and discussion, and then also to advance research, uh, monitoring, and evaluation methodologies. And finally, uh, build partnership uh, within the SBCC community. Uh, the summit has three sub themes. One is catalyzing transformational change on agendas of urgency. So that is uh, unleashing the power of SBCC uh, for different kinds of issues. Uh, the second theme is around future forward and how the digital media is transforming SBCC work and uh, issues around information and disinformation, which we are looking at today. And finally, connecting the dots in terms of the connectivity for actions. Uh, we've had at the various activities at the global level and at the regional level. At the regional level, the South Asia conversation is ongoing. The Latin American Caribbean conversation is ongoing. The Middle East and North Africa conversation is ongoing. And the Sub-Saharan conversation, uh, which is divided into two forms, uh, are also ongoing. At the national level, we've had Malawi, South Africa, we're having Nigeria today, and hopefully we'll have Zambia soon. And also we will have in regional conversations and consultations, which include the SBCC summit uh, and climate action in March, uh, East Africa, SBCC for collective action, and the Francophone Africa uh, will be looking at those areas. So just maybe uh, as a kind of introduction, why SBCC and SBC? Because we know that sometimes people move from SBCC to SBC and different kinds of uh, titles have been used. We know that it is critical for um, uh, engaging people, amplifying the voice, changing perceptions, behaviors, and social norms, and contributing to improve health outcomes. However, uh, the WHO in 2020 had said that the history of public health in the 20th and 21st century is full of examples of misinformation, which has caused tremendous harm in, during, during the process and, and damaged trust. It goes on to say that in a digital world, stakes are high because of misinformation and mixed messaging, and therefore recommended that we need a full rethinking of the evidence-based approaches, especially to the infodemic uh, con uh, con uh, context and putting people and communities at the center. Therefore, when we talk about SBCC within a disinformation age, we are talking of issues of fake news, fact, hoax, conspiracy narrative, and stuff, things like that. There are three inter interrelated concepts disinformation, disinformation, malinformation, and they, they, they relate to what has been described as information disorder, which is based on falseness and lack of truth in information to harm. So we have misinformation, disinformation, and uh, uh, malinformation. We know that misinformation is information that is not true, Disinformation is information that is forced, for, uh, created falsely and deliberately to harm. And malinformation is information that is, although based on reality, is used to inflict harm. For example, using some kinds of information without context to ignite uh, problems. So examples of information, uh, misinformation is misleading information, tricks, deceiving, lies, fraud, spreading dishonest information. 
Linked to that is uh, this information, which is also inaccurate information, but falsely created to uh, achieve specific objectives. We also know that this is linked to conspiracy narrative because as it has been uh, argued, we're in an age of connection links and uh, relationships. And many things have become conspiracies in the world today. Uh, when we talk of conspiracy narrative, we are talking of a theory that rejects the standard explanation of an event and instead looks at uh, covert ideas that organizations, individuals, deceptive plots have put in place. So that is conspiracy narrative. And we also know that the current information environment at a global level, especially because of uh, social media, uh, is in a state of what experts have called in a state of flux with, uh, with social media being very extensive, multiple sources of information, multiple platform of information, weak institutional rec uh, regulation, and uh, the whole individual accountability being very important. So the nature of the current information age that we have is the one that has been called post-truth, which devalues knowledge, which politicizes information, data, and research, which sometimes rejects mainstream knowledge, expertise, and evidence, which is based on zero trust. People don't perhaps trust any other person, which is based on heightened public mistrust, which has serious questions about trustworthiness of information, trustworthiness of information sources. Competition uh, for truth and loss of truth, and we are actually critical thinking in where we are. This situation has major implications for SBCC work because we now have a very flooded environment work. We have a very active audience, especially with digital citizenship uh, that are generating information at different points in time. We have a strong, what is described as conspiratorial thinking around health issues. Everything around health issues are, has become an object of uh, uh, conspiracy theory. We are having pseudoscience, we are having fake news, alternative facts, and we now have more effort to debunk and pre-debunk uh, uh, especially as far as information concerns. So these are some of the implications of our work. We also know that public health in general is prone to misinformation or disinformation, whether in terms of uh, the drugs that are used, pharmacies and doctors and diseases that are there. And we also know that according to WHO, we're now in an age of infodemic, which is, called, which is described as overabundance of information. Some accurate, some inaccurate, uh, too much information, which is uh, uh, misleading and which can cause confusion and, and which can also lead to lack of trust in health interventions. So this is where we are as far as the uh, environment is concerned. So the point is, how has this manifested in some of the various issues, uh, health inter areas that we have? One is COVID, and we're not going to even go into too much details about this because we know we are still in it. Two years into it, we've had different kinds of conspiracy theory. It's a bioweapon, it's 5G, it's Zionist plot, it is uh, an outburst of some pharmaceutical interventions, it is a uh, competition between the US and, and, and China, it is uh, Bill Gates, it is 5G, it is employed by governments to install police state, it's many things. And we know that even in Africa, as we have studied and uh, the moderator and I did some kind of analysis before, even when uh, there has been extensive misinformation around it, and even when the narrative has changed, we are still having new information denying the fact that the, uh, the, the pandemic exists after it had uh, killed 5 million plus people in the world today. That is almost like two nations of Botswana together. 5 million people are gone. And what we have seen, especially in Africa, is what we describe as an army of ill-informed uh, pundits, so-called experts, quacks, prophets, religious leaders, and political leaders who have done so much damage to the information space. What is the consequence? We've seen the reign of misinformation and massive overload of misinformation. We have seen a legitimization and a denialism of the, of the pandemic. We have also seen tremendous challenge in the battle for be a healthy behavior with low risk perception, poor illness behavior, and vaccine hesitancy. This is what we have seen with the coronavirus. But let me tell you, it is not new. 
hundred years ago with the pan with this flu, uh, the Spanish flu, 1918-1919, uh, same situation. There were different kinds of conspiracy theories regarding the origin. The flu was based on was blamed on foreigners was blamed on Jews, was blamed on dancing, was blamed on jazz music, was blamed on bombing the soil, was bl blamed on pretty, pre pretty much everything. There were rumors that, okay, it was the Germans who decided uh, to invade uh, the world at that time, spraying with weapons and stuff like that. They even Some people even claimed that they saw uh, German submarines that were infecting the entire atmosphere and the, the, the theaters with that. So we had serious uh, misinformation and disinformation 100 years ago. And what was the consequence similar to what we had with the uh, COVID-19? Let's move from 900 years back to like 40 years ago with HIV. HIV and AIDS, we have also experienced similar misinformation, disinformation in terms of its origin, in terms of its treatment. There was information that, oh, it was associated with false vaccination theory, with hepatitis B, with oral polio vaccine, uh, meets on treatment because of uh, mistrust and rumors that were there. For those of us who have done a lot of work in HIV prevention, we have stories of, oh, it was a man-made virus by Western press, uh, governments to kill and wipe out the Black race. It was a genocide attack on Blacks. Uh, it was produced in the laboratory and stuff like that. 30 years after, we are also seeing that some of those conspiracy theories are there. A study was conducted in 2011 and another was, was conducted in 2015 in South Africa. And it was found out that many Blacks uh, Africans aged 20 to 29, eight times more likely to think that conspiracy theory was engineered by, was uh, likely to think that AIDS was engineered uh, by uh, scientists in the laboratory. So this is what we have seen. From HIV, we moved to Ebola. We have also seen tremendous amount of misinformation with Ebola, false information, partial information, and sometimes uneven, unable to establish the truth about those kinds of information. Rumors, again, that Western governments and pharmaceuticals were injecting people with uh, the, the virus, and there was prevalence of non-scientific information with the people, which has also affected the response of, uh, of uh, different kinds of audiences. And we also have some pastors and prophets and teachers who thought that they will be able to use uh, their prayer power and other spiritual means to control it. So with Ebola, we've seen that too. And finally, with even an issue like climate change, so much disinformation, so much uh, misinformation that is taking place, whether within the scientific community or with those that have uh, political interests, so that we've now seen political polarization uh, with, with respect to the climate change communication. And uh, the, the Guardian did a study recently and found that tremendous staggering uh, misinformation on Facebook. This was was a, a report that was published, I think, a week ago, which had 45,000 posts downplaying the climate crisis, and which some of these things have been seen by 1.3 million views. So this is the challenge of this information that we have had. And whether it's in the area of children's immunization, we've experienced it, women's rights, we've experienced it, sexual and reproductive health and rights with family planning, we've seen it, and condom and sexuality education, we've, uh, we've seen it and condoms. This is why we are saying that we need to rethink our work as far as SBCC is concerned. What has been the impact? It has undermined risk perception. It has affected health-seeking behavior. It has weakened confidence in health interventions and programs. And it has also, to some extent, destabilized some work that has been done within the context of advocacy and social change. So what is my conclusion? Conclusion is we know that misinformation and misinformation is part of the human society, but the volume intensity and velocity of this in the digital aid is unprecedented. Errors of information through misinformation, fabrications, rumors, propaganda, conspiracy theories, characterizing our current information ecosystem. And we therefore know that the negative consequences of this information society poses a major challenge for SBCC work. We note that there are no magic uh, bullets to defeat rumors. But we need to continue now to accept this as a social, social fact in terms of its origin and effect. 
We also need to know that trust, greater trust with the community is critical to help in reducing the underlying function of rumors and an awareness of the role and implication of uh, disinformation in SBCC work is critical. This is why we argue for a rethinking of the SBCC theory, research, training, and practice. In the area of uh, theory, we believe that there should be new focus on theoretical approaches to developing communication through what has been described as a new transdisciplinary approach that will re 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 reintegrate and revisit uh, some of the existing theories because in a digital age, some of those theories are not particularly working. Uh, as far as uh, practice is concerned, we need new strategic approaches to be able to target different kinds of audiences, whether they are informed, uninformed, mal malinformed, or misinformed, or even disinformed. And then we know that the audience must be a critical part in the co content co-creation and dissemination. And of course, as WHO has said, people, people and communities must be at the heart of SBCC in the post-pandemic age. How would we achieve this? addressing the historical reasons of distrust, communicating openly, facilitating what has been described uh, as people-centered approaches, building accountability and in integrating the diversity, the diverse polarized uh, flow of information in SBC's work through social listening. It also has to empower and educate people. And finally, rethinking uh, our uh, training. So our training in SBCC definitely has to change. And I know that uh, Professor Juan, who will be speaking after me, will be talking about health education, health promotion, some of the skills that are necessary. The skills and the things that we'll be talking about will be critical here too. To address health misinformation in the whole society is critical and just only a blended approach that recognizes the dimension of information and the infodemic within the uh, ecosystem and linked to the health and well-being of all will be important. And I hope to see you in uh, Morocco for the summit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Fayoin. Um you have talked extensively about a number of issues, a number of issues that has to do with the theory and the practice, looking at experiences you know, across the continent, looking at experiences globally. And uh, you know, if we learn lessons, we'll learn from what happened with uh, HIV AIDS, uh, those days of uh, HIV AIDS cure. You know, it started in uh, Zaire, uh, it's moved to Kenya. From Kenya, it moved to other countries. Then it landed in Nigeria, uh, where aid care was being proposed. I mean, uh, promoted. But at the end of the day, uh, at the moment, we don't. I mean, I don't think any of those people that that uh, promoted that uh, all those uh, products, you know, really had what it takes. And um, quite a number of issues that you've you've talked about. I will not. Uh, uh, try and repeat some of the things that uh, I mean you have said. Uh, I will let uh, Professor Ajumo uh, continue to lead us, you know, uh, in this presentation, so that we won't waste uh, any time. But I'm sure that if you are listening into the presentation by uh, uh, Professor Fayoin, uh, you realize that uh, uh, he mentioned that there is no magic bullet that can defeat rumors. Uh, we need to uh, acknowledge social facts about the origin, the effect, and tracking changes in rumors. You know, this is very necessary for us to prepare for the next uh, uh, pandemic. Awareness of the role, implication, and prevalence of disinformation. You know, we need to really address that. You know, in the how, how this influence SBCC programs. Uh, in order not to waste our time, I would um, uh, like to go to the next uh, presenter. Uh, Professor Ademola Ajumo. Uh, professor Ajumo is a professor at the Department of Health Promotion and Education from the University of Ibadan. Here he has uh, been teaching, he has, conducting, he has been conducting research, he has been mentoring, supervising you know, young faculty since 1991. And uh, his area of research interest covers adolescent reproductive health, HIV AIDS prevention, social media and research ethics. Uh, Professor Ajuan has also participated in a number of international scholarly training in terms of fellowships as a visiting scholar at the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies, University of California, 
San, San Francisco in 1997. Uh, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, USA in two, two, 2003, and a, a DAD staff exchange fellow at the University of KwaZulu Natal. DAD uh, has a German linkage. Uh, he was part of that uh, fellowship in South Africa in 2012. And uh, he was also a, a senior exchange fellow at the College of Medicine, University of Malawi in 2017. Uh, Professor Ajuan, um, I would like to welcome you. He's going to lead us on health promotion in Nigeria, shifting boundaries and borders. Professor Ajuan, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Akin, for that introduction. I hope everybody can hear me and my screen, my uh, slides are visible. Can you please confirm that? Can you see my slides? Yes. Thank you very yes. much. So I'll be looking at head promotion in Nigeria, uh, shifting boundaries and borders. Okay. Awesome. So always we like to start a, with, a, with a definition. What really is health promotion? And I'm going to be relying on the WHO definition that was provided way back in 1986 that looked at health promotion as a process of enabling people to increase control over their health and each determinant, and in the process, improve their health. We also know that health promotion is a core function of public health, which contributes to the overall work of tackling not only communicable, but non-communicable diseases and other threats to health. And we know from our continent that we have a demographic shift. We have previously have challenges in communicable diseases, but now there's increasing incidence or even non-communicable diseases. Now, when we talk about determinant of health, I just want to refresh our memory of what we are talking about. So there are many factors that influence health and determine whether people are healthy or they are sick. Policy and the environment where it is being uh, implemented, the physical environment play an important role, as well as the social and economic environment particularly income. So we also know access to quality healthcare play an important role. Biology, that is people's physiological makeup, and very importantly, from a public health point of view and from a health promotion point of view, behavior play a critical role. So the mix of all of this is what determines whether individuals are healthy or they are, they are not. So this uh, slide paints that picture of the determinant of health. Again, trying to refresh our memory that health promotion have four major components. We talk about the development of healthy public policy. Policy play an important role uh, in any environment. We talk about health education to individuals and communities, very important. We talk about the reorientation of health system to improve accessibility, acceptability, and appropriateness. We know in Nigeria, for example, that the way our health system is distributed is skewed in favor of those who live in urban settings to the disadvantage of those who live in rural communities. So the orientation component of health promotion try to bring in equity in terms of the spread of health facilities, in terms of access that people have, as well as appropriately. Then, of course, we have advocacy to influence policymakers to adopt healthy policies and enact laws, and that these laws should be enforced as well. It's one thing to have laws, it's another thing for them to be, to be fully implemented so that the entire public can have full benefit from those laws. So I want to start my story in this presentation to look at the pre-pandemic times 
because I think the pandemic have made us to have a division. Although we are still in the pandemic period, we are not fully out of it, but we have had some leeway of getting out of the pandemic. So pre-pandemic, the key role of the health educator or health promoter, to use a more generic term, is to plan, implement, evaluate health promoting activities, including social and behavioral communication interventions in various settings, such as the schools, doing outreach, in workplaces, and in places of worship. This has been the traditional role that health promoters play as far as their own contribution to public health is concerned. However, when the pandemic hit, everybody was caught unaware. The only person who seemed not to be surprised was I think Bill Gates, who said, who has predicted much earlier of what is, was coming. So today, this is the situation. More than 500, 250 million people are already infected by the coronavirus. And more than 5 million people have died, as you can see in this uh, slide. But fortunately, more than 7 billion vaccines have been distributed. That has been the major public health intervention that we have had to counter the pandemic. But these figures don't tell the entire story. These figures, particularly the figures of those who have died, they are individuals. They have names. They are brothers, they are sisters, they are fathers, they are mothers, they are uncles. It's those who are affected that really know. Just think about the loss. Just within two years, five, more than five million people have died. And the last 28 days, 201,000 people have actually died. So this is, a, this is a serious challenge to public health globally. So this is what has now defined where do we go from here and the challenges that has arisen as a result of the pandemic. So we know that in Nigeria, Nigeria was not spared. This is the information that I have as at end of October. Uh, this is the number of tests, more than 3 million tests have been done, of which you have 211,000 uh, people affected that are confirmed. And the majority of people have recovered and we have recorded 2,894 deaths. And of course, as you are aware, the virus has not been reported in all states of the country, including the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja. So Nigeria uh, is part of the statistics. And fortunately, we have been spared of the severity of the impact of the, of the virus. And epidemiologists are still wondering, what is it that has given protection to not only Nigeria, but even many countries in Africa? But that is not the subject for discussion for today. So what has the challenge posed? What has, how have, what has it been the challenge posed by the pandemic to those of us in the health promotion community? My colleague have already laid the foundation. The first challenge was, is that of infodemic, where we have an overload of information of the treatment prevention and the coronavirus. The implication of an overload is that it has become increasingly difficult to distinguish between evidence-based inform, evidence information misinformation or, and disinformation. And of course, we know misinformation is a message that is false, that is misleading or harmful, but is shared anyway by a disseminator who believes that it is very helpful, that that information is helpful to others. We know that during the pandemic last year, and particularly during the lockdown, there were so many messages that were forwarded. Even people do not read those messages anymore. They simply kept forwarding them, forwarding them to members of their church, forwarding them to professional colleagues, thinking that those information will be useful 
Unfortunately, many of this information were actually false and misleading. But the disseminator thinks that that information is helpful. And there are several consequences of it. For example, we have report of overdose of chloroquine due to rumor that this particular drug prevents uh, the coronavirus. Then, of course, we have the classical case of disinformation, which is deliberate attempt to confuse or manipulate people through delivering dishonest information. My colleague has already dealt with this. So this is the major challenge that we face in the health promotion community. Now, in responding to this, our borders became a little bit extended. So what lessons have we learned in the health promotion community? We have learned that we, have, we now have to take new rules. Our relevance to public health has been brought more to the fore. There's now increased appreciation of the role of public health in the fight against the pandemic. We have been increasingly called upon to de develop policy in different areas. And we have known that research is going to play a critical role in the fight against the pandemic. And of course, we know that local and international collaboration have resulted as a result uh, uh, of the pandemic. That even after development of vaccine, citizens still need information to accept this critical uh, intervention. So these are lessons. Now, what new roles have the health promoter have to adopt or undertaken in response to the challenge? So we, we have become myth, myth busters. We have been invited to, to radio, to television, to make presentations. We have written news reports, newspaper debunking rumors and misconceptions, including those relating to COVID-19 vaccine. We have become role models, particularly in the adoption of non-pharmaceutical non interventions, such as the use of the face mask, hand washing, and social distancing, taking of tests, and even receiving the vaccine. Because as role models, we must first demonstrate uh, these interventions in order to encourage others. We have also become advocates, working with other health professionals to advocate for delivery of critical interventions, including testing, provision of uh, PPE, and even vaccine distribution. And we have also taken the role of resource link, where we work with communities to facilitate access to critical public health intervention such as testing and vaccination. So these are our new roles which we have taken in addition to those roles we have played in the past. Moving forward, what are the critical skills that the health promoter need to remain both locally and globally relevant? The earlier speaker, and I think I can also mention that there will be other challenges. It may not be in the form of a pandemic that we are likely to encounter. So how can the health promoter prepare himself to remain globally and locally relevant? We need to develop more our emotional intelligence. We should listen to other perspectives. We should respect other views. Our intervention should be driven by evidence. It is when we use evidence for our intervention that we can really make a, make a difference and the profession can gain respect. We need to multitask more. We have to be good planners, good researchers, and good communicator. And other roles that we have played hitherto. We need to maintain our existing and expand even new networks, reaching out to people, places, professionals, communities, both local and global. Because we know we all live in a globalized community. The, the, Coronavirus started in Wuhan, in just one of the regions. In one year, two years, it has spread to the entire community. So we should never limit our network. We should expand it because we'll be tapping on this network as we move forward in our professional career, in our preparation to do our work even better than we have done hitherto. We need continued education. We need to hone our existing skills we need to learn new ones in preparation for challenges. 
posed by both local, national, and global unpredictability in the world in which, in which we live. So let's know how promoter think that he has, he has arrived. We need constantly to hone our skills, participate in webinars like this, international meetings, and learn new ways of doing things. We need IT skills. We need technology in communication, in a changing and rapidly successful, uh, in order to, to be successful. We need to learn, adapt, and deploy new technology. Today, the WhatsApp is uh, widely used, but there is another you know, platform, Mixler, which we currently know that is superior to, to the WhatsApp. So every day, new technologies is emerging, and the head promoter who wants to be globally and locally relevant, who wants to extend his border beyond Nigeria, needs to adapt to this new technology. Virtual platform has become the new way of learning and is a new reality, and we all must embrace it, regardless of the challenges that it pose, something with weak internet, poor network, virtual learning has become a reality, and all health promoters must embrace it. We ourselves must be models of best public health practices. Can you please help? There are a lot of noise. Can you mute everyone? Can you please mute? Thank you. The health promoter need to be models of best public health practice. We take our exercises seriously. Our nutrition should be healthy. Routine checks for vitals, our blood pressure, prostate, pap smear, mammography for women. Because we need to be healthy in order to serve our community. We need to embrace all of this, to live longer, to be healthier, and to be productive and to live productive life to serve our communities better than the way we have done, and to prepare ourselves to future challenges we're likely to encounter. In conclusion, the pandemic has taught us how fragile and unpredictable our world is. And the skills of the health promoter must continue to, to be required and to be improved upon as we face future challenges. And the health promoter, must continue to adapt to new challenges, both locally and globally, in order to continue to remain relevant. On that note, I say thank you very much for your listening. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Professor Ademola Ajua. Um, you notice that in the presentations that we've had so far, there were a lot of mentioning about COVID-19, other emerging infectious diseases. And uh, you know what I did? I went to fetch my face mask. Uh -huh. Because I saw that there are about 157 participants at one point. I said, how can I be in a room with 157 participants? Uh, this is just for us to at least smile a little. Um, thank you, Professor Ajumo, for uh, this presentation. Uh, it's uh, indicative that we need to learn new skills. Uh, new technology has, has come up. I remember those days in the mid-90s uh, when uh, uh, internet just came, uh, at least in the US. We did not have internet access most of the time within uh, this country and probably most other African countries. Uh, but nowadays there are new technologies and so on and so forth. So we need to retrain, train and retrain. Um, the aspect of new media is very important. Look at the disinformation, uh, forwarding messages and so on and so forth. Uh, also NCDs re remain, non-communicable diseases remain a major issue that we need to really address. Uh, Professor Juan uh, uh, talked about you know, regular exercises, the kind of nutritional uh, intake that we have, uh, and so on and so forth. 
uh, I think at this time, uh, I will cede the floor to uh, Dr. Oji. Uh, my name remains Akin Labi Jimo. Uh, I'm the um, Executive Director for Development Communications Network. I'm also the Chief Editor for Nature Africa. And uh, it is nice to have all of you here. Uh, we'll go to the next section. Please, if you have questions or comments, um, the, uh, there is a button. Uh, when you count from left of your screen, the fourth button, the first one is your microphone, the second is your uh, the video uh, icon, the next one is the number of participants. After this is question and answer, and then you have the chat box and so on and so forth. So please drop your questions so that the panelists can answer uh, your questions. Those that can be answered immediately will be answered. Those that can be answered, you know, in the general uh, um, room, you know, will also be answered. Thank you so much. Uh, we now have uh, uh, my co-facilitator, uh, Dr. Bright Oji, uh, to make the room brighter. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Ake. Um, it's been a very interesting and exciting conversation, and I'm sure that um, we are really having fun, and we are also enjoying ourselves. Um, we'll be moving further into this conversation, and I have another pa uh, panelist um, who is also very erudite, and will be able to throw more light on the topics we are discussing, but from another dimension. So I've been introducing to us Dr. Rufus Esuche, Dr. Suche is a public health strategic social behavior change practitioner with over 25 years experience in international development. Dr. Suche has expertise in designing, implementing, and managing behavior change interventions, particularly focusing on children and youth. Um, Dr. Suche holds a BA in sociology, a master's degree in business administration and strategic management, and a PhD in creative industry. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to bring to you Dr. Suje to speak to us on unleashing transformational change through youth activism and engagement. Thank you. Dr. Suje, please over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Oji. I'm requesting Dr. Demola to pull down his screen so that I can okay. be able to share mine. All right. Let me do that. I think that is done. Can okay. you? Yeah. Uh, it's still telling me no, but uh, let me try again. Yeah. No, not yet. I don't know why. Marvelous, please handle this. Yes, it is pulled down. Okay, all right. Okay. Marvelous, please undo this. <clears throat> so there's a hitch. So if uh, Marvelous can share the screen for me, I'll be grateful. Are you able to? You can start introducing your topic before it, that is done while he's processing that. Okay, all right, okay. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair and uh, colleagues and uh, participants in the webinar. Uh, it's indeed a great pleasure to speak to you this afternoon. Uh, it's always not very easy to speak after two eminent professors because that is what uh, they do most of the time. They teach and they speak very elo eloquently. So I hope I'll be able to keep you awake as well. My presentation today, as you've been told, uh, it's on unleashing transformational change through youth uh, activism and um, I will uh, basically be trying to situate uh, this presentation 
in, in the context of COVID-19, but also just to go a little further, some of the examples or discussions that we may go in might be a little out of the COVID-19 um, situation, but I would really like to keep it under that so that uh, it's uh, precise. Uh, also, what um, the very few slides just to walk us through and discuss this important subject. And it's really meant to uh, provoke the discussion at the end of this. So don't expect me to come up with many answers to how to unleash the power, uh, the transformation of power of the youth, but I might be able just to raise as many questions um, for you uh, to provoke discussion. Next slide, please. Uh, every time we hear the term activism, I think uh, most of us think of uh, many things. So I decided just as a way of starting just to look at the key words in our, my title and try and just put them in perspective. Uh, activism, sometimes it's even uh, uh, when people hear of activism, they associate it with violence. Uh, but uh, I think we're just merely talking about action of using vigorous uh, before that, uh, you have gone too far. Okay, vigorous campaigns uh, to be able to bring about change. When we talk about engagement, again, uh, putting this in perspective, uh, very often a lot of us in development talk about engaging people, but uh, sometimes that engagement might be what people refer to as tokenism. Uh, but in our context, we really want to talk about genuine involvement and commitment of working with the youth. And then the last key point, uh, what I want to look at is the, the definition of youth. And there are very many definitions out there, but I want us to focus on the young people between the age of 15 and 24 as uh, under the UN uh, definition. Next slide, please. Um, this slide just gives you an, uh, an idea of when we're talking about the youth power across the globe, uh, depending on which source of your data, we're looking at approximately 18% of the total population, whether it's globally, we're talking about 7.7 .7 billion people, 18% of that are people in this age bracket that we're looking at. If we come to Africa, it's about the same between 17 and 18 again. And when you come home to Nigeria, again, uh, the, the age bracket of 15, 24, fall, the percentage of the population fall around 18%. So that's our average population we're looking at. And this, this is really huge number of young people who are very resourceful, very active, very energetic that we need to tap into. So having that picture at the back of your mind, uh, you can just see how we can be able to unleash this power to be able to utilize it, engage with them, and use them very constructively. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, I just want to briefly look at what is the value of engaging with the youth. And in the UN circles, we usually talk of the triple value. One is really harnessing the potential of young people. We know how productive they are. It's a force to reckon with. And just being able to harness that potential and work with them towards a cause, I think it's a value to us. Secondly, looking at how we can be able to engage with the youth to address societal needs and challenges. There are very many issues affecting young people, affecting a cross sector of uh, population. But when we engage with the young people, we are able to address some of these issues through that initiative. And then just being able to drive our agenda at work through various institutions that we deal with that have these young people. We call that the triple value of youth engagement. But for us to be able to do that, you have to prepare to do a number of things. One, you have to be ready to share the power with them. Because remember I talked about tokenism, we just don't want to say that 
we are working with young people and yet what you are doing is just present a few of them uh, to the cameras and say, this is what we are doing, but be ready to be able to share with them the power that you have as an institution, as an individual, as a community and so on. We have to also build that relationship. It's not a one day affair. We're not just going to call these young people today, sit across the table and say we have engaged them. It's a process of building a long lasting relationship. We also want to encourage them to be able to you know, explore, discover and express themselves. There's, there's so much that they're able to do, but when they don't have that opportunity, then that energy is just bolted up. So encourage them to do that and express themselves. And then also be able to instill the skills. We know that as um, institutions, as um, various organizations, we have been able to uh, learn so many things, but it's an opportunity for us while engaging with them to be able to instill those skills, those meaningful learning experiences to the young people. And also just be able to provide that leadership opportunities. Quite often, uh, we, we keep on saying that uh, the youth are the leaders of tomorrow. We forget that we need to begin providing that opportunity for them today so that they can nurture that and so on. Next slide. How do we do that? Uh, there are quite a number of uh, models, uh, but I've just selected uh, a few uh, points that I want to share with us during this discussion as we don't have much time. What we need to do is first and foremost to involve them at the design and decision making from the beginning. We should not sit as adults, design what needs to be done and then present it to them. But we want to engage them from the word go so that they're part and process of that design and decision making of matters that are going to affect them. We need to have a clear purpose through the implementation plan so that we're not just beginning something today but we are not sure where we're heading, but that implementation plan has to be in place from the design stage up to the end. We also have to know what sorts of resources we need, both material, whether they're human and so on, so that the resources are, are available. And when we begin implementation of that plan or the engagement, we have all that is required at hand. Of course, we won't have all that is required all the time, but we just have to make sure that the prerequisite requirements are in place. We also have to empower them through meaningful roles that align with their skills. Look at what they're able to do, whether they have digital skills, they have innovation, then empower them to be able to put those roles where they can do, put them to be able to implement that plan and then provide the support that is required to continue building their skills through training for them to be able to succeed. Next slide, please. Through our experiences working with young people, I think there are a lot of things we have learned, but there are two key things that I just want to be able to share with you during this webinar today. It's always a win-win situation. I think quite a number of us, when we want to engage with uh, youth or young people, we start feeling like we might be able to cede our power, cede our position and lose something, but it's always a win-win situation. Young people will gain from the skills, the knowledge, the experience that they get from us, while as adults who are engaging with them, we also benefit from the competencies that they come up with. We learn a few things from them and their value increases, you know, whatever initiatives that we are doing. I think that commitment, when it's there, we see the value of that energy into the initiatives we do. We know very well that young people now are very good, especially at digital platforms. When we bring them on board to be able to work with them, I have seen myself a lot of value, learning a lot of things that I would never have been able to learn when I engage with young people, especially when it comes to innovation and digital platforms. So it's always a win-win situation 
and that is documented. We have seen through it, and uh, 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 you can count on that, that you can never lose when you're working with young people. Next slide, please. We have a lot of best practices, lessons that we've learned that again, we can be able to share while engaging with young people. But I just want to point out eight areas, uh, approaches that uh, have been widely used uh, that have been well documented, that we think are very good practice. One of the approach is coming up with youth councils. When you come up with an initi initiative, you establish a council of young people so that through that council, there's, it becomes a formal body which then advises the particular implementation of the initiative that you are doing. That has been widely documented. I think it's a very good approach to engaging with young people. We also have a second model or approach that has been documented. Uh, please, no, not yet, not yet. Uh, we're looking at the youth governance where we let the young people take the role of leadership. The third one is on youth advocacy where we just give them a platform to be able to speak you're giving them a voice where they can be able to be heard from. The fourth model or approach is you invite young people to be able to sit on a board, be it an organization like the UN, and you have young people who have a space on the board of UN where they can be able to speak from. The other approach is just to let youth organize themselves. So you come up with a design of an initiative, as I've said, and then let them organize and run it. The, the sixth one is the youth voice platform is being had. It's very similar to the youth advocacy, but uh, depending on the variations within the model, you can be able just to ensure that uh, uh, it's, you're providing with them a platform where they have. Youth service is one of the approaches that you know and is widely used even in Africa, where we have uh, initiatives driven either by the government or organizations, and you have young people serving uh, in the community uh, doing various things. So those are just some of the uh, approaches that I wanted to share with them. Some of them have their uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages, but I don't think we have time to go through them today, but I just wanted to share them with you. Next slide, please. Nothing comes without challenges. And I just want to uh, quickly on this slide, talk a little bit about the challenges we have had when we're engaging with young people, especially during uh, this COVID uh, initiatives that we have had. Uh, the speakers before me spoke of evidence-driven initiatives. And uh, you realize that uh, when this pandemic hit, uh, a lot of us were in the dark. We were waiting for information from out there, the WHO, or job organizations who are carrying out information so that we can be able to use that information to drive whichever initiatives we had. Lack of evidence, I think, in fact, for focusing on young people was not there. And it became a really challenge for us when we were engaging with them because it was very difficult to convince them without having facts that will be able to convince them about something that they needed to do or not to do. Keeping youth interested and motivated, you know, like young people, uh, they, 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 they want to start something and finish it immediately. So if you don't find a way of keeping them motivated and interested in an initiative, you lose them very fast. So to be able to keep them, to drive a program that uh, you want them to, you have to ensure that uh, they are very well motivated so that they don't move to the next thing. Quite often, I think one of the other challenges we find us as adults, we are so much stuck in the things that we have done before. We keep on saying, no, we have used this before, it, we have done and it has done very well. So that uh, we forget that uh, we have to change. So that becomes a challenge when you are working with young people, you need to be able to adapt to new ways. Misinformation, I think has been talked a lot and I'm not going to go into that detail, but what I just wanted to emphasize here is that uh, young people during COVID, being on digital platforms played a very big role in 
you know, passing this misinformation, disinformation around. And it was a challenge while working with them for us because they were always ahead of, they, before even the information comes to us, they already have it. And, you know, you have to try and keep up with that. And this has led to a lot of issues around a low risk perception among them, or even the vaccine hesitancy that we are facing as a country now among young people. And lastly, the expectations of young people, usually when you're looking at a, a program, is usually beyond that. And in the context of COVID, when we are trying to come up with programs that address social and behavior change in COVID, they are thinking about other issues beyond COVID. So the expectations are usually ahead of sometimes of the program. So you find your challenge as a person who is programming, you have to begin thinking of their income generating activities and other social issues that they may affect them for you to be able to keep them uh, uh, focused on what you are doing. Next slide. So moving forward, uh, I just want to comment, and uh, I don't. I didn't want to call this. It's the last slide. I didn't want to call it recommendations. But uh, based on the lessons that we have learned, we have seen a lot of things that uh, we need to focus on to be able to work with young people. One of them is research. For us to be able to gather that evidence that I talked about, we have to invest in research. And uh, moving forward, I think we have learned that uh, even through COVID, we have to carry out a lot of studies, a lot of assessments to be able to come out with facts that will be able to drive initiatives. We have also to strengthen coordination structures. When you establish, whether it's a council or just an initiative that uh, has young people, you have to put in place structures that are strong enough to be sustainable. Building capacity, I think we've mentioned about that. I don't want to go into details. We have to continuously continue uh, uh, training them, building their capacity in different areas for you to be able to work with them. Partnerships are very key. And one of the areas that we've seen are very important, partnerships with media and the private sector to be able to support some of the initiatives that are with young people. Uh, the telecoms, uh, the media houses are very good at that. And then lastly, just being able to recognize and reward the youth. We see this uh, when we work with the social influencers and champions in various areas where it's very important for you to be able to recognize their importance, be able to reward them for the work they do, and also just make them or recognize them as champions in that particular area. And then uh, you're able to do. Uh, I think that's all. The last slide is basically uh, talking about this, the youth always look at this as our movement. And the key word here, they say, nothing about us without us. So you cannot do much without involving them because if it's meant for the youth, they have to be at the core of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rufus Esitui for this uh, exciting presentation. I'm sure our participants and audience have heard you well. Um, you have added another dimension to the conversation. We are glad to learn from you the need to harness the potential of our young people to address societal challenges. We also understand from your presentation, with the emergence of technology, the youth needs to build the digital skills that will be required for nation building and solving the societal problems. We also learn as um, the leaders of tomorrow, the youth needs to be involved to ensure that um, they also have the appropriate knowledge and there's a way to go, particularly building up network and partnership that will help to reinforce some of these challenges and then um, uh, bring in informations that can help our society. It is very important for us also to note the best practices that have been shared by you and I think that we can align some of the things that we're doing today toward those best practices because that's actually what will help us. Much more importantly, when you talked about research, the importance of research cannot be overemphasized. There's a need for us to engage in vigorous research that will generate the evidence, the evidence that can help to formulate policies, make decisions, influence practice, and further research that will help the society. Thank you so much. We are glad to learn from this. So moving forward um, with our conversation, uh, in this conversation, I think we have to go to question and answers and then probably return to have the last presentation as the time will permit us. So Aki, I come back to you. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, uh, President of Health Promotion uh, and Education Alumni, Dr. Bright Oji. Um, a number of questions have been asked on the quick Q&A platform, and uh, I would like the panelists to uh, look at the questions and uh, give us some answers. And uh, probably we can accommodate about three um, uh, questions that will be live. Uh, that will be, and then you need to uh, just raise your hand. Uh, there's an icon you know, on the net, but we'll first go through the question. Um, Maria Galeng says, we need different scientific and, uh, and evaluation framework that allow us to include local cultural structures of knowledge. Uh, more or less saying that we need uh, different uh, scientific and evaluation frameworks to allow the inclusion of local cultural structures uh, so that that can serve as baseline structure in implementing programs. Uh, I don't know if we have any comments uh, on that. Um, anyone can, can go with that. And then you can just look at the the icon for question and answer and uh, uh, panelists. Yes, I can, I can start. I can start. Uh, thank you very much for that. Yes, we know that evaluation, monitoring and evaluation, very critical to our work. And sometimes many of the evaluation tools are designed from different kinds of environment and do, they don't take in, in, in to context, the cultural issues, social issues, and stuff like that. But uh, within the context of what is called resource-based monitoring and evaluation uh, uh, systems, some of the local uh, insights have been integrated into that. And so I think uh, when people are familiar with new perspectives around monitoring and evaluation, they will be able to integrate those ones that have been attuned and are, are, culture, uh, are custom, uh, customized, that's the word, customized to the local context. So, but we note that evaluation, uh, monitoring and evaluation system is very important. I also respond on the other question. I think it says that, uh, what is the space? Uh, how do we relate to individual change versus public uh, health policies? And uh, while I was noting that, I, I, I Noted the fact that within the SBCC space and the health education and public uh, public prom uh, health promotion space, the concept of ecological model is important. Where we look at individual changes, interpersonal changes, community changes, uh, organizational changes, policy context uh, at the global level. So if we apply, if we uh, look at change from this ecological model, it is possible for us to be able to connect both individual behavioral changes with the needed policy and community changes that are critical uh, for that. The third question that I'll address has to do with the role of head, health education uh, in uh, addressing rumors. Uh, the point is sometimes even the health educators are not well educated about the issues. And therefore, when they have doubt in themselves, they won't be able to. So the starting point is for them, as uh, Professor Joanne says, to be skilled, to be updated, to be educated on the issues. And two, for them to have done what is called values clarification. What are my values on these particular issues? So that as a health promoter or as a medical person, social worker, I am fully informed and then I'm going to base my uh, advice, my suggestion on, on valid evidence rather than on pseudo evidence or hearsay or rumors themselves because we have had instances when health workers and nurses actually promoted uh, anti-vax uh, campaign, anti-coronavirus uh, uh, campaign. So I think those are very critical for them to be fully informed and once they are convinced themselves, it is, it is easier for them to be able to convince others. Uh, so maybe I'll just leave the other colleagues to respond to the other points that are there. Second, thank you. Okay, yeah. So one one of the questions that caught my attention is the one that uh, Professor Fire just addressed about health promoters who are themselves uh, uh, reservoir of uh, misinformation. So it's shameful and disgraceful that uh, a head promoter is himself or herself is ill-informed. That's why I recommended that for the head promoter of the future who wants to be locally and globally relevant, you need to be ahead of the curve. You need to constantly uh, improve. And how do you do that? You need to be connected to the practice community. 
And I think uh, when we are members of any social media, I know the most popular in Nigeria is WhatsApp. <clears throat> Once we see any message that is uh, misinformation, we should remind people yeah, before you post any message, please ensure that it is true. If you are not sure, please don't pass on. Because it is, what we have found is that people keep forwarding messages. Many of them are not correct. So the head promoter of the future, who want to be both locally and globally relevant, must be ahead, must be constantly informing himself through interaction with the professional practice, through conferences, and through self-education. This is the only way the health promoter can actually be a model of the best public health practice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Isuji, any response to some of the questions and comments on the platform? Um, there, there, there is a question uh, that is uh, directed to both uh, Professor Fayoyin and Professor Ajiwa. Um, while we are waiting for Dr. Esuji, uh, is there any rest for addition you want to, uh, to make? Yes, there are a few other questions. Uh, one from Louis Eluzai, who is asking that misinformation spreads, spreads faster than uh, correct information. The truth is we know that. And the whole issue of virality, everything going viral is where we are. Because once people add salt and pepper to misinformation, it just goes like that. So the point is what she's asking, you know, he, what theories are there? So I think the starting point is to understand the principles of virality, how things get viral, so that they can integrate these principles into how they're designing content. Uh, Content uh, that are myth busting and content that are responding to specific issues may not go as viral as others, but at least they are able to reach. And so I think uh, uh, applying those principles of variety will be very important. Another question that was raised was that, especially in Nigeria, some people think the virus is over. I, and that is true for some people uh, that when I engage with Nigeria, they say, ah, please come, the virus is over, the virus is over. But as of today, the virus is still killing, the virus is still affecting people. Even if we have not felt the impact of the virus as other countries have felt, it doesn't mean it is over. And until it is, on, and until it is over, we can say that we are fine from it in Nigeria. Many European countries are actually going on some form of partial lockdown now. The, the, the right they had before to stay till 10 o'clock has been changed to 7 o'clock, has been changed to 8 o'clock. And in some countries in Europe, they are, uh, they are going on demonstration. So yes, the impact of the virus has been felt in other places, not with us, but you remember that some other uh, issues have affected us much more than them. For example, take HIV. HIV affected Africa much more than other places. So the fact that this particular pandemic hasn't affected uh, Africa as much as other places doesn't mean it's not there. It is still happening and we need to take necessary caution until it is done. I can see Bright's hand. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I don't think it is me. Oh, okay. There's a very okay. interesting question here. There may be also is addressed to Professor uh, Fayoye and Professor Juno, um, coming from Fayoke, who said she wants to learn from you, you know, in, uh, in what way said promotion SBCC field and practitioners can contribute to building and rebuilding trust in the system in ways that have ripple gains on public health emergency response now and in the future. Okay, I can... And, and, and before you go on, I think there are some other related uh, questions that was talking about risk communication. Uh, there is uh, this thinking that risk communication has more or less taken over in terms of responses, in terms of funding, compared to health promotion and health education. Maybe you can you know, take the, the two together. How can we position health promotion and health education in a way that it can respond to, you know, to new things and, and so on and so forth? And probably okay. after this, there are about three questions for uh, Dr. Suji. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, trust is something you earn. It's not something you can give. 
So uh, we live in an environment where we, the citizens, don't trust the government. And citizens don't trust government because of past experience. When our leaders tell us something, but we discover that that is not really the case. So that is the environment in which we have found ourselves. And when it comes to trust, we can learn from the example of the US, where the African-American com uh, community do not trust anything government because of past experience about what happened in, with the Tuskegee syphilis trial, another atrocities committed uh, you know, on a racial basis. So that is a challenge. However, should the head promoter fold his arms and say, well, that is the environment in which you find yourself. You can, based on the work you do, in the communities that you that you operate, you can develop that level of trust that people can rely on you. If you in your community, for example, when the vaccine is available and you are at a uh, landlord meeting, for example, and you hear concerns that people have made and you are in a position to correct those misconceptions, you will begin to end trust. And you not only correct misconceptions, you actually work with the uh, local government authority to ensure resource link that even the COVID-19, I mean the COVID, uh, the vaccination is available. Then uh, you facilitate that process that people can have it, and you yourself demonstrate that you have had your your, your full shots. Then whatever you tell them, you begin to end their trust. So this is how trust is uh, is developed. I know that. Within the global environment in Nigeria, trust of leadership is a serious problem. But at our different spheres of influence, at our local communities, we can begin to, to build that trust. And if you all work collectively together, we can begin to make a difference in our community. So don't let's be discouraged by what is happening in Nigeria uh, with regard to how we see our leaders and how we do not trust them. We can begin to make a difference in our different local communities and end people's trust. Let us start at that level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there is a, a hundred pounds gorilla question here for Professor Suji. Uh, it's about end science. And uh, the question is a double barrel question. It says your presentation focuses on the former youth activism with clearly defined goals and objectives and provision of necessary support to ensure these goals are achieved. So what is the place or how do we support informal groups that emerge spontaneously to ensure the overall purpose of activism on a particular goal is not derailed? And the second question, uh, which is also in, in related to NSAS, it says NSAS protests in 2020 in Nigeria, which ended in fatal consequences for many, many young people involved in the action. So my question here is, at what point should we withdraw or change of approach be adopted in pushing an agenda among youth, young people, irrespective of it being a formal or informal group? Uh, I think that's the, uh, I, I think we can just, uh, we can, you can go ahead with this. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Akin. It, it's, as you said, is a double barrel question and uh, indeed um, not an easy question to respond to, but I'll, I'll try and just be as brief as I can and I hope um, my perspective uh, would help. Uh, every time uh, one is uh, designing a program, we say you have to come up with what we call a theory of change. And in that theory of change, you, you ask yourself question that this is what I want to do, but what if this happens? What will be the mitigating factor? What will I do to mitigate that? So, um, and I think that's the approach we need to have for any initiative that involves young people in a community or in a situation like we found ourselves with the NSAS is that we are going out uh, to, um, it, it, it's to advocate for this cause. But what if this happens? What do we do? So at what point do we change tact? So when you have that already 
lined up, then it's very easy for you to decide, okay, at this point, then we need to stop this course and probably think of redirecting our effort in this other direction to continue with our objective. You cannot continue going with the same strategy because even in the military, uh, strategies change based on what if happens when we go to the right and our enemies on the right, you change tack to go on the, you know, that's that sort of approach. So that's, that's the way I, I would simply put it. Sounds very simple, but think forward of what will happen when this crosses our path, then you can be able to think of when you withdraw, when you change tact, and when you employ other measures to uh, uh, advocate for that cause. Uh, I don't know whether, Ken, I should go ahead and just touch on other questions that are there uh, because please, I looked at them, or should I? Yeah, yeah please, please go, go ahead. Please okay, go ahead. So, so one other question from Olusola was talking about how do we harness informal groups and I simply just want to say that, uh, in fact, when informal groups come up with an initiative and as a, uh, for us in development, we notice that uh, they're able to do something. I think the best way to do is to s s try and direct them now into, you know, a, a programming because it's, it's informal. They may not have um, designed it from uh, as it is in the book, but it's more of an organic uh, project for them. So uh, we we help direct or redirect their efforts in a way that we think it will help them, or we, we go in to build their skills so that they can be able to sustain that initiative, or try help them mobilize resources so that uh, they can sustain that uh, in brief. Uh, they, must, they must also also ask a question on health literacy initiatives. How do we help engage young people to do health literacy initiatives? Young people are very good at uh, various uh, approaches, like we say, edutainment, peer-to-peer -peer approach, and uh, identifying them as champions to be able to talk to their peers. So we can look at various models, as I said earlier on, what model do you want to take, and then be able to help them. Edutainment, apart from them assisting in health literacy, it can also be an income generating activity for that group. Okay, yeah. I think my colleagues have touched on those other questions that are, are addressed to me, but they are all touching on the critical issue of trust, credibility, and trust of those doing them. So I just want to emphasize the point Prof has said at the end. I think the issue here is trust the government, trust the institution that is driving that initiative. And once that trust is there and it's not an issue of tokenism, then uh, we are able to achieve what we want to do. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, th thank you. Um, I think this is uh, to uh, the, 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 all, all the presenters. Um, there's this, I have this strong belief that health promotion or preventive medicine, you know, is very key in achieving, you know, uh, health for all or the goals of SDGs or any other goals, you know, in terms of public health. But a lot of the time, African governments, you know, focuses on uh, curative medicine, you know, in terms of clinical medicines and so on and so forth to the neglect of health promotion and other related things, uh, issues. And uh, when you look at, in the past, in this country, we have what we call in Yoruba, they call them wole wole. Uh, these are sanitary inspectors. These are environmental health officers that will go to homes, look at the sanitary you know, uh, states you know, of the homes, of the environment, and all the other things. And if it's not uh, really to, the, uh, to satisfaction, uh, there is some form of interdiction whereby you are charged and so on and so forth. And I think uh, Professor Fayoyin mentioned something about that in terms of uh, how do we address you know, this? How do we, should we just go ahead and promote? And then some people will say, yes, this is true. And, uh, oh, this is, I don't believe in this. And uh, you can also look at it from the rights perspective. Where my rights stops, someone else's rights start from there. So how do we balance rights-related issues with health promotion and health education in the way we implement you know, our activities. Anyone? Health is integrated. 
uh, it's not the absence of uh, disease, it's the presence of total well-being, it's both spiritual, physical, uh, economic well-being. So it's, it's multidimensional. And therefore, the response to our health issues must also be integrated. But we know that uh, sometimes we are focusing on the pharmaceutical, uh, forgetting the behavioral, we are focusing on the curative, forgetting the preventative and all that. So these are some of the challenges that we have faced. Until we learn how to ensure that both are integrated, it will not work very well. I mean, I work in USF, work in USAID, I work in UNFPA. One of the things that we've been trying to push throughout all of this uh, work is to ensure that these things are done integrated, multi-sectoral, multi-partnership and stuff like that. And within the context of uh, the SDGs that many of the organizations, international organizations are implementing, it also talk, talks about integration until we learn how to do effectively programming that are integrated, that look at life cycle approach that are focused on the society, will just be doing siloed intervention that don't particularly achieve much results. So I think the focus is as, as programmers, how do we bring back I don't want to say bring back this, bring back holistic integrated response uh, as far as uh, health uh, engagement is concerned. Okay, uh, the other contribution to that is that it is not a look, it's not a problem peculiar to only Africa or Nigeria. Globally, politicians want to show off their achievements by building structures. So it's a, it's a common problem, it's a common phenomenon with, uh, with uh, political leaders, because it's easier to say that where well, we build this uh, uh, five uh, star facility, it is going to provide the high class service and so on and so forth, because people can see to demonstrate their achievement, which is very myopic, because you must keep equal emphasis for both prevention aspect and curative aspect. We know that in the long run, Prevention work, but it's difficult to always prevent, to always demonstrate it because you have prevented death in the first place. Okay, so how do you, how does a health educator or a health promoter operate in that environment? We need evidence, more and more evidence in terms of interventions that are rigorously uh, designed and evaluated to demonstrate that, well, if you didn't do anything, this is what is likely to. To, to occur. So the head promoter should not be discouraged by this type of attitude. But we need more evidence. That's one. Two, we need more head promoters to also go into the political arena and get to leadership position in such a way that they can begin to influence decision and policy that will give you equal emphasis for both the prevention and the curative aspect. So this is the way to, to, to really go. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Uh, just a brief question from uh, Professor William Briga. Uh, he's, uh, he's mentioning that, I mean, how does implementation and intervention research uh, prove value of SBCC? How can we use intervention research and implementation, uh, uh, implementation and intervention research to prove the value of SBCC? I think this will be the last uh, question for us. Well, my take on okay. Yeah, go ahead, Professor. Right. Yeah, my take on that is that to the extent that we use evidence and that we apply rigorous evaluation design, we will we need to complement the activities of each other. So if the health promoter is conducting an intervention, it should not just be an intervention that is done without evaluation. Because often people ask, how can we be sure that the differences that you have found is as a result of intervention and not other, other, other variables? So we often face that challenge. So the, the onus is on, on the health educator or the health promoter is to employ rigorous evaluation design and provide the evidence. That is one. Two, we live with implementation science, the primary goal is that interventions are done on a small scale. How can we upscale it in such a way that it is uh, replicated in the entire community? So, and we also need partnership. The health promoter alone cannot do all of this. 
You need to reach out to other professionals at the level of conception, providing the evidence, disseminating it using the most appropriate uh, channels. I think these are ways by which we can begin to demonstrate the relevance of health promotion and how it is uh, it can be used to enhance um, uh, social and behavioral interventions. Thank you, Anova. Yeah, Professor Fire, you wanted to say something. Uh, just to know the point that every time we are always talking, what is the value of SBCC? What's the value of intervention and stuff like that? Experience over the years in various kinds of interventions have shown that, that these things do work. So we have the knowledge, we have the evidence of what works. I think scale is important. Uh, outcome mapping is important. Implementation science is important. Uh, many other types of engagement is also uh, important for us to use as we demonstrate the evidence. But the flip side of it is sometimes why are they asking for the, 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 the effectiveness and the value adding of SBCC and not of the other areas. So sometimes we, we feel there's a competition in the, in, uh, in the implementation space between the various professionals, the hardcore and perhaps the soft, uh, soft, soft, uh, soft functions. Uh, so I think recognizing the, the balance and the integration of all the various elements in the implementation process will be very important. Thank you. Uh, at this stage, uh, I would like to hand over to uh, uh, Dr. Oji. Yeah, thank you, Ake. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll have a great time. And unfortunately, our fourth presentation um, may not come up uh, due to some technical issues. Um, but um, we have had a great uh, time here listening to these three great erudite uh, uh, speakers. And also, we have really learned a lot. Um, at this stage, probably we'll also be closing this uh, webinar today. And we're hoping that in not far distant future, we are going to hold another one. Um, it has been a great experience. So, Dr. Oji, from... before, before we close uh, quickly, uh, an exit uh, interview is being posted uh, on the chat. Uh, please kindly fill it before you exit. It will take you just like two minutes to fill. Marvelous, please post now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aki, for that update. Uh, so please um, try to uh, fill the form before you exit. So from this end, I would like to extend our appreciation and thanks to Professor Adebayo Poyoyi from Witt School of Public Health, Johannesburg, South Africa, and also a visiting professor of mass communication, Caleb University, Lagos, Nigeria. We also would like to thank uh, Professor Ajuo from the Department of Health Promotion and Education, University of Ibadan. Um, thank you so much. And then Dr. Rufus Esuche from UNICEF Nigeria. Um, it has been a great time having you all make presentations. And we have learned quite a lot from you. I'm sure that it's going to help us to build into the future of what we are doing. Okay, Professor, Adeba, you see, I can see your hand is raised. Yes, it's just one quick point. Uh, as we, in the lead up to the International SBC Summit taking place in Morocco next year, like we said before, we've been having country conversations and sub-regional conversations. Uh, what we've had today is actually uh, has been replicated in South Africa. And then we also raised the issues of trust, coordination, engagement, and social listening and evidence. So these are cost-cutting issues that we need to, to continue to look at. When we had the Malawi event, there the whole, it was focused on knowledge, uh, knowledge uptake and the knowledge management of some of the findings that they have undertaken. And they also were talking about how we mainstream knowledge, how we ensure that knowledge frames advocacy, and how we ensure that we do what is called integrated advocacy. These are issues that we are putting together that will be taken to the conference uh, in uh, Morocco next year. So thanks very much for this. And I will hope that, um, as uh, Aki and Bright are saying, based on this conversation, perhaps there may be other issues that I want to interrogate even in future before the summit. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I um, mean, there's no other thing, I think we would like to end the meeting here. And I want to thank our great participants for being part of this. Thank you so much. And we're hoping to see you soon. Goodbye and God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.